The Catechism's answer to the questions concerning the Blessed Trinity are very clear, and we should all know them really, that there is only one God and that there are three persons in God. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit should be familiar to us. And we should also know that these three persons are not three gods. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are all one and the same God. But of course, it is a mystery. Now, when we talk about a theological mystery, we speak about something we cannot gain knowledge of by our own human reason. By our human reason, we can know that God is, that he is one, infinite, unchanging and the creator. But to know who he is in himself is something beyond us. It is something that God himself must show us. And out of love, he does indeed show us. He reveals himself to us so that we can seek him by faith. And as we accept this knowledge of him by faith, we come closer to him and experience his grace and his love in our life. Pope Benedict XVI gives us a helpful starting point when thinking about belief in the Blessed Trinity. Indeed, he talks about that of how we experience God. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew people's understanding of God was coloured by their love of him as the father of Israel, the father of all peoples, the creator of the world and its Lord. Then he notes how from the New Testament period, God shows himself to us from an as yet unknown side in Jesus Christ, who is at the same time both fully man and fully God. And this divine revealer is not some kind of intermediary being between God and man. He is fully God, but at the same time fully man. And along with us, he calls God Father. Christ then, although God himself, must be someone other than the one he and we both call Father. And he mediates for us with the Father. Now, if he were anything other than fully God, he wouldn't mediate in the same way. There would be a separation between him and God, as there is for us. And so he reminds us in the Gospels, I and my Father are one. And so in this new perspective on God, God meets us here, not as Father, but as the Son of the Father, as what the spiritual tradition calls our brother. And, says Pope Benedict, this is followed by a third experience of God, the Holy Spirit. And again, this Spirit is not identical with the Father, nor with the Son, and nor is it a thing set up between God and us. But rather, the Holy Spirit is the manner in which God gives himself to us. It is the way that he brings about his indwelling in us, and yet at the same time remains completely above us. So the experience is beautiful. And we can see that from the very beginning, the Christian faith came to deal with this triple experience of God as a matter of sheer fact, that this is how it is to experience God. In time, the fathers and theologians would try and reconcile this triple understanding of one God. St. Clement of Rome, writing in 96 AD to the church at Corinth, asked, have we not one God and one Christ and one spirit of grace? Now, in the centuries after this, theologians tried to develop a more, let's say, scientific understanding of the Trinity, beyond a mere experiential account. And using Greek philosophy to help, particularly the concept of the Logos, which we discussed before, many theological approaches were made. And here's the thing, in trying to come up with a clear and precise description of the nature of the Trinity, well, they hit a number of snags along the way. These snags tended to perhaps erode the equality of the three persons, or perhaps depict them as three gods. Some of these attempts made the Son subordinate to the Father, or make the Son a sort of creation of the Father, or that the persons of the Trinity the three of them are just manifestations of one God. They came to have names like 
tritheism, Sabellianism and partialism, modalism and subordinationism. Now, while in the context of our little catechism, we don't need to worry about these names too much. But they do explain why, when trying to sum up an ineffable mystery, we can get ourselves into theological hot water if we're not careful. And it's why no father relishes the task of preaching on Trinity Sunday each year. But let's do have a think about this in a little more depth. St Thomas Aquinas reminds us that the truth of the Trinity is beyond human reason to know, prove or to disprove. We know his truth by divine revelation. We accept it by supernatural faith and we take it up upon the authority of God himself who reveals it. Once we know the truth naturally, we begin to discuss it. But we have to remember always that our words and descriptions are imperfect and will always fall short of summing up God. It's just not possible for us. But rather, we are able to speak truly, if only in a small way, of the nature of God. Still, Aquinas says it is helpful to use abstract terms to try and explain our knowledge of God. So there is one God and three divine persons. These three persons in God, while really distinct from one another, are nevertheless one and the same, undivided and indivisible divine essence. Father, Son and Holy Spirit then are personal names for God. So in the Father, the first person of the Trinity, divine paternity is implied of him. It is the Father who is eternally generating or begetting, not creating, the Son. Of the Son we can say that eternal filiation, eternally being Son, is proper to him. He is the one who is eternally begotten of the Father. The other name proper for the second person of the Trinity is, of course, the Word. The Father is eternally knowing himself and expressing that knowing by a Word. And so this Word, the Son, is eternally generated as the image of the Father. And they have a relationship with one another. And it is by these relations that we know them as distinct persons. And since there is nothing in God that is not God, we can say that that image, or being the image, implies a relation of the Son to the Father. And so this relation gives us the name of one of the persons. But more on this next time. And proceeding from the Father and the Son is the third person of the Trinity the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son is very important. If the Spirit only proceeded from the Father alone, Aquinas tells us, he would have no relation of opposition to the Son and so would be identical with him, which Revelation shows us he is not. We can think of another way. Aquinas tells us that another personal name for the Holy Spirit is in fact love. It is by the Holy Spirit that the Father and the Son love one another. And since there is nothing in God that is not God, this love too is God, but is infinite and perfect and has been revealed to us as another person within the unity of the Blessed Trinity. So the way that God comes to dwell within us is by his love. And more than that, even, because they are in union with one another, where there is one person of the Blessed Trinity, there is all three persons. And so while we recognise them individually by their operations, their works, it is the Blessed Trinity that dwells within our soul and wants to share the divine life with us. One last thing, and that is our being made in the image of God. Well, our soul reflects both God in unity and in trinity. In our soul, as our intellect and our will interact, we are mirroring something of the life of the trinity. St Thomas Aquinas points out that in God, the Father begets the Word, and from the Father and the Word together proceeds, spirates, breathes out the Holy Spirit, the love shared between them. In the powers of our soul, Aquinas sees that our intellect begets a concept, a word, if you like. And the intellect with its word 
wins the recognition or the love of the will. We will a thing because we know it to be good and we love that thing. It is a way in which the powers of our soul mirror the life of the Trinity. But that Im image can also be seen in the soul, since the soul can know and love God, both divine actions and only possible because of God's supernatural gifts in us. Well, let's end this time now with a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, by whose grace we acknowledge both a trinity of divine persons and a unity of essence, grant that being clad in this armour of faith, we may be strong to withstand every attempt of the enemy to destroy us, and grant that we who now live by faith in the single essence of the Holy Trinity may grow by increase of good works and may one day be welcomed by thee into its very presence. Amen. Hello to all the children who are preparing for the Sacrament of Confirmation or for their First Holy Communion here at the Oratory. I wonder when you were little if you ever played with that puzzle where you have to fit all the shapes through the slots that match them. Perhaps you watch your little brothers and sisters doing just that. Well, you might have noticed that the cube won't go through the circle shape and the pyramid won't go through the hexagon. Well, that's kind of symbolic of what we're talking about in this session, the Blessed Trinity, or at least how we think about the Blessed Trinity. We believe in one God in three divine persons. The first person of the Trinity is the Father. The second person of the Blessed Trinity is the Son. And the third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. All three are the one God. They all share the, the one Godness, the, the one essence. But we know them to be individual persons in the way they relate to each other. The Father is the Father to the Son and the Son, the Son to the Father. And the Spirit is breathed forth from both of them as the love that they share. There is an ancient saying that there is nothing in God that is not God. And so the love that the Father and the Son have for one another is also God. And so is a person too. It might be a bit confusing. But you see, it's because we can't work it out by our own efforts. If we were to look around the universe, well, we can eventually come to know that God is powerful and creates and orders things and is good. But we could never work out on our own that he is a trinity. He has to reveal this to us, to show us what he is like. Well, this is what we mean by a mystery, not like a detective story where we put the clues together and work out who the baddie is, but rather we depend on God showing us what this divine mystery means. And so it is a godly, a divine mystery. And we must not forget that we are created in God's image. This means that our soul, which is most like God, reflects something of God's being. In our soul we have different powers. One is our memory, uh, our, and another is our intellect, and yet another is our will. And you see, we can remember in our memory how to do something, to, how to use a skill, how to remember a fact. Our intellect can then, knowing that our memory is good, consider it. And then we can will it into action, we can decide to do it. All three are the powers of our one soul, and yet they all have their own function, their own job to do. Well, this is just a little pale reflection of what the Trinity is like in itself. So, remember, learn your catechism and say your prayers. We'll end today with a glory be to the Father and we'll make the sign of the cross. Remembering, of course, that when we make the sign of the cross, we are asking the Holy Trinity's protection. St. Patrick in Ireland many, many years ago described living in the Holy Trinity and the Holy Trinity living in our soul, being like armour against the devil. Well, we pray that we will remember that we are clad in that 
invincible armour, that spiritual armour which will protect us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.